I read a story the other day about two construction workers that was working on a large building in another town. And two of these workers fell in a real deep, muddy, dark pit. One of them said to the other, Hey, help me get out of this pit. Help me to get out of this dark, muddy pit. Would you please save me out of this pit? And his buddy there beside him said, Hey, I'm in the same shape you're in. How do you think I can help you when I'm in the same shape and need somebody to get me out of the pit to save me out of this pit as well? And then all of a sudden they heard a voice from up above that pit calling out to these men, Hey, I've thrown you a rope. Grab a hold of this rope. You see, that one who was not in the pit... That one who was not in that muddy hole was the only one that could save them two men. The very best man, the very best woman in our midst today could not save us from the pit of sin. Because each and every one of us, we are sinners. We're born into that same pit of sin. But Jesus Christ was perfect. Jesus Christ was sinless. Jesus Christ was both God and man. And since He was pure and since He was holy, He was able to save us out of the pit of sin. Only He can save us. The last week we began a series of messages about Jesus being born for a purpose. And we looked in Mark 16 how Jesus was born for the purpose of conquering the grave. This week I want to say that Jesus was born to be our Savior. That's the title of our message today. Jesus was born to be our Savior. I want us to look at a passage of Scripture this morning where an angel appears to Joseph. This angel reveals to Joseph that Mary is expecting a child. A child that was conceived supernaturally by the Holy Spirit. And this angel, this messenger from God, reveals to Joseph that he has a role in this story. His role is to take care of Mary. His role is to name this baby Jesus. And this angel reminds Joseph and informs him that this child that is about to be born has a purpose to save his people from their sins. I want us to read together in Matthew chapter 1 beginning at verse number 18. Matthew chapter 1 beginning at verse number 18. If you don't have a copy of the scriptures with you, feel free to follow along on our screens. In Matthew chapter 1, in verse 18, the Bible says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. What does this text reveal to us about Jesus being born as a Savior? Well, I want to point out to you a couple of facts this morning about Jesus, the one who was born to be our Savior. And I pray that as each of you listen to this message, 
that you look within your heart and examine and see if Jesus has become your personal Savior. First of all in this text, the first fact is this. Jesus is perfectly qualified to be our Savior. First of all, this text reveals that Jesus is perfectly qualified to be our Savior. You say, how so? How is Jesus perfectly qualified to be our Savior? Well, we see here He's qualified by His virgin birth and conception. In verse number 18, we see that Mary and Joseph, they've not been together sexually. Mary is expecting a child. She is expecting a child. Matthew makes it very clear that was conceived by a miraculous act of the Holy Spirit. In verse 20, we have this angelic messenger that God sends to speak directly to Joseph to inform him that he doesn't have to worry about Mary being unfaithful. He doesn't need to think about divorcing her. He could follow through with the marriage even though Mary was expecting because she is expecting a special child a child conceived by a virgin girl and by the Holy Spirit. I found something interesting in this passage here. You see, over in Luke chapter 1 in verse 13, an angel appears to Zacharias and says to Zacharias, Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. But in verse number 21 of our text, this angel speaking to Joseph says, Mary shall bring forth what? A son. Not you a son, but a son. Further speaking of the virgin birth. Further speaking that Joseph was not the biological father. This is further proof that Jesus was born of the virgin Mary. Not by a natural conception, but by a miraculous miracle of Almighty God. And since God is the father of Jesus and not Joseph, Jesus didn't inherit a sin nature, a nature of sin that's passed down through the federal head of Adam to all of the human race. Jesus Christ, the God-man, was perfect and sinless for he had God as his father. And then not only is virgin birth and conception qualifies to him to be our savior, but his name. Look in verse number 18. Matthew tells us that he's writing about the birth of who? Jesus Christ. The name Christ there means anointed one. In the Old Testament, this speaks of the Messiah, the long-expected one that would come to crush the head of the serpent, thus bringing deliverance from humanity's sin. Jesus, the Messiah, the long-expected, eternal, all-powerful one that would come to be King of kings and Lord of lords. But not only we see Jesus mentioned as the Christ. But in verse 21, this angel tells Joseph, Joseph, you're going to have the responsibility of naming this child, and I want you to name him what? Jesus. The name Jesus literally means Jehovah is salvation. The Hebrew form of this name is Joshua. Here Jesus came as the ultimate Joshua, the fulfillment of all the Joshuas in the Old Testament. One great Joshua in the Old Testament was Joshua the son of Nun who succeeded Moses. And by the law of God, he led the children of Israel into the land of Canaan. Another great Joshua in the Old Testament was Joshua the high priest. And he interceded for the people of God after they returned from the Babylonian captivity. But Jesus, the greater Joshua, is the one who was born to lead his people not by the law of Moses, but by the law of grace 
and love into the eternal land of Canaan with him forever and forever. Jesus, that greater Joshua, is the one who ever lives as our high priest, as our mediator, as our intercessor in heaven. Not only does his name, his virgin birth, but his humanity qualifies him to be our Savior. Here, the Son of God becomes the Son of Mary, a human. The eternal Son of God is conceived and born a Son of Man as a human now. And as a human, Jesus came into this world. And since he came into this world as a human, he's approachable. He's touchable. He is reachable by you and me. You see, as God, he is extraordinary. But as a man, he became ordinary. And since he became a man, he can identify with you and me. Since he became a man, he experienced life as we do. Since he became a man, he faced temptations just as we do. Since he became a man, he could be our representative on the cross as our payment for our sins. Sometimes in businesses when they're looking to hire a person to fill a serious position, they'll put out an ad on Indeed.com. And on Indeed.com, they'll list what the job is, that description. And then they'll list the qualifications. And applicants will send in resumes. Applicants will send in cover letters. And then the CEO or the HR department or someone, maybe even the owner of that organization, will begin to go through those resumes and then possibly start to the interview process. Why? That person is trying to see if the applicant is really qualified for the job. Do they have the credentials? Do they have the experience? Do they have the ability? Do they have the talent to do this job? Well, when it comes to the Lord Jesus Christ, Matthew wants us to know in this first chapter that Jesus is qualified to be our Savior. He has the right credentials. He excels all others. He's got what it takes, the virgin birth. He's got what it takes to be a Savior. He became a man. He's got the name to go along with His work. Jesus, Jehovah, is salvation. You may look through history and you may even look through the world today as it is and you'll find people throughout time that have claimed to be a Savior of people. But I want to tell you, you won't find anyone more qualified than Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus is qualified to be our Savior. Number two, I see another fact in this passage of Scripture. And that is Jesus was born exclusively to be our Savior. Notice in verse number 21 of our text something here. This angel is speaking to Joseph about Jesus. And he says to Joseph about Jesus... He will save His people from their sins. The phrase, He will save, look at that right there. In the Greek, it literally means He Himself will save and He alone will save. What does that mean? That means Jesus and no other came to be our Savior. God didn't send Michael, the mighty archangel, to be our Savior. God didn't send Enoch, that man who walked with God, to be our Savior. God didn't send Abraham, that man of faith, to be our Savior. God did not send Joseph, that man who saved the Egyptians and the Israelites through a severe time of famine. God didn't send him. God didn't send Moses, the man who received the Ten Commandments there on Mount Sinai to be our Savior. God didn't send Moses. God didn't send David or Solomon, those two great kings in Israel's history. 
God didn't send Jeremiah or Isaiah or Ezekiel or Daniel to be our Savior. God didn't send even John the Baptist to be our Savior. Who did He send? Jesus and Him only to be our Savior. God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Savior. Listen, and God has not sent another, nor will He ever send another. He sent Jesus and Him alone to be our Savior. Jesus made it clear in John 14 when some asked, How can we go to the Father and how can we know the way to the Father? And Jesus clearly said to Thomas, What? I am the way, the truth, and the life. I don't know about you, but that gets me excited to know that we got the right Savior. In Acts chapter 4 verse 17, the Bible says, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Did you catch that? No other name. Also, this means that Jesus came personally to be our Savior. In other words, Jesus came to do the saving Himself. He came to live the sinless life that we failed at. He came to die a death on the cross that we were not fit for. He came to be buried in a grave that is made in this world for human beings, but only He could fill He came to rise again from the dead, something that we would be helpless at. He came to do the saving without any of the help of the prophets, the angels, the priests, or even you and me. He came to do the saving work for you and me all by Himself. When we go out to eat with our family, mom and dad... And my brother and his wife and their little kids, Hadley and and Pumpkin, when we go out to eat, we'll all order. And then when we get done, me and my brother will pull out our billfolds. And my daddy will say, I got it. And I'll say back to him and my brother will say, well, let us get the tip. No, I got it all. Listen, I want to tell you something, folks. When Jesus came to this world to be our Savior, He and He alone was sent. He and He alone did the work that was necessary for us to obtain eternal salvation. And listen, you or me or nobody else can add anything to the saving work that Jesus done. God's salvation is exclusively provided by Jesus and Jesus alone. That's why the old song by Augustus Top Lady, Rock of Ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself to thee. One of the verses says, In my hand no price I bring, But simply to what? The cross I cling. You see, when we come to Jesus Christ for salvation, it's a free gift. And you and I, no matter what we think we can do, no matter what we think we can offer, it would never be sufficient and it would never be acceptable by Almighty God. But when Jesus Christ came into this world, He was the sufficient, exclusive sacrifice for salvation one time for all times by Himself. Look to Jesus. And then number three, I see another fact in this passage of Scripture. We're talking about Jesus being born for a purpose. What? To be our Savior. And this passage here tells us that He was born to be our Savior from sin. Look in verse 21 of our text. The angel says that Jesus will do what? Save His people from their sins. Notice the angel didn't say Jesus would save people from misfortune. The angel didn't say Jesus would save people from sickness. Jesus didn't come to save us from turmoil in this world. 
Jesus didn't come to save us from the social ills of this life. Jesus didn't come to save us from bad luck or financial disparity. No, he got down to the real problem of humanity. And you know what the real problem of humanity is? S-I-N, sin. Romans 3 and 23 tells us that we're all sinners. Isaiah 59 verse 2 says, But your iniquities have separated you from God, and your sins have hidden His face from you so that He will not hear. Romans 6.23 tells us that the wages of sin is what? Death. Romans 6.23. Then Ezekiel 18.4 says, Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins, what? Shall die. It is sin that leads to death, ultimate separation from God in eternity. Sin is the problem. Sin is the root. Sin is the cause. Sin is the source. Sin is what separates people from God. Sin is what keeps people from having a relationship with Him. Sin is what takes a person to hell. Sin is the reason that Jesus one day will look at people at the great judgment and say, I never do you depart from me what you worker of iniquity it's sin that is the problem but the good news is Jesus came into this world as the perfect God man to save us from our sin (laughs) I love that that's the good news of the gospel yes sin is ugly and sin is bad but that makes Jesus look even more that much better he came to save us from sin, the real problem of humanity. Notice that word sin in verse 21. It's in the plural. Literally that word means all varieties and all degrees of sin. In other words, Jesus came to save sinners who have committed all types of sin. And I want to say this morning, there's no sin too dark. There's no sin too wicked. There's no sin too heinous for which Jesus cannot save you from. Jesus came to deal with sin, to defeat sin, to take sin out of the way. That which separates between us and God. And then I see that word save. He came to save us from the effects of sin. Notice that word save. In the Greek, it's the word sozo. It literally means to deliver, to rescue, to keep from harm, to bring out safely, to set free, to preserve from danger. That same term was used during the biblical times outside of Scripture to speak of someone being snatched out from a serious problem. It was used to refer to a physician saving someone from an illness. It was used of the act of delivering a person from judicial condemnation. In other words, Jesus came to save us from the serious effects of sin and the eternal consequences of our sin. He came to save us from the spiritual disease of sin. He came to save us from the sentence of eternal condemnation in the court of Almighty God. He came to save us from not only the penalty of sin but the power of sin. Sin enslaves, sin destroys, sin wrecks, sin steals, sin ruins. Yet Christ entered this world and broke the power of sin. Sin has affected this world. It's affected our bodies. It's affected how we relate to other people and how people relate to us. Sin has cursed and marred this world Yet Jesus also saves from the presence of sin. 
One day you and I who know him as our Lord and Savior, we've been saved from the wrath of God because of our sin. We're being saved right now from the power of sin to control our lives as we become more and more like Jesus and less and less like our old self. But one day... When we go home to be with the Lord, we'll be given a new body that's just like the Lord Jesus Christ, a body and a mind that's not wrecked and ruined by sin and will be placed in an environment that's sinless forever and ever. I love that. Several years back, most doctors practice general medicine. However, in recent years, you know, there's all types of specialists. If you've got heart problems, you go see a cardiologist. If you've got cancer problems, you go see an oncologist. If you've got teeth problems, you go see a dentist. So when it comes to the sin problem, there is a physician in the house. And this physician is one who specializes, this angel says, specifically in sin. If sin is a problem for your heart and life, then I urge you to pay a visit to Dr. Jesus and let him save you from your sin problem. I notice one more fact. And that is Jesus was born to be a savior of his people. Now his people specifically in the context here would speak of his ethnic people, Israel. He will save his people from their sins. He came to be a savior to the descendants of Abraham, to the Jewish people, the lost household of Israel. And since he came to his own, and his own did not receive him, he now is the Savior of all the world, of peoples from all over the world, of every tribe, from every nation, from every corner of our globe. His people specifically refers to broadly all who would believe. All who would receive him, they would become his people. They would be the ones adopted by the Father. They would be the ones who would know salvation and the free pardon from sin. They would be the ones who would become not national Israel, but the spiritual Israel of God. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 14 tells us that Christ redeemed a people that would be His own special purchased possession. In Titus 2, 13 through 15, the Bible tells us that His people would be looking for His second return, His glorious appearing, a redeemed people, a purified people, His own special people zealous for doing good works. Matthew 16, 18, Jesus spoke of His people and called them what? My church. My called out assembly of people to do the work of my kingdom. A people redeemed out from among mankind to people that will follow him and be with him wherever he goes for all eternity. You say, how do I become one of his people? In John chapter 1 verses 12 and 13, the Bible says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. To receive literally means to take hold of, to grasp. You become one of His own people by responding to that inner call of the Holy Spirit to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, to yield to Him, to surrender to Him as Savior and Lord. That's what it means to repent and to believe on Jesus Christ. 
the story is told of an atheistic barber and he was talking to a pastor and the barber said back to the pastor if there is a loving savior how can he allow poverty war and suffering and just at that moment outside the window there walked by a disheveled dirty man his hair had not been cut in a long time his beard was long his face was dirty and the preacher said back to the barber barber you're a good one aren't you don't you claim to be a good barber yes and the preacher then said, How can you allow that man to go unkept and unshaven? And the barber replied, He never gave me a chance. To which the pastor said, Exactly. Men in this world are what they are because they reject Jesus. They never give Him a chance. Jesus was born to be our Savior. He must be received as our Savior. And so I want to ask you this morning, is Jesus your Savior? Diane, will you come and play us a song, please? Is Jesus your Savior? Can you go back to a time and a place in your life where you called out to the Lord, said, Jesus, save me. Jesus, be my Savior. Jesus, I receive you as the Son of God, as my Savior who took care of my sin on the cross, as the Lord of my life. Have you done that? Let's stand to our feet, ever head bowed and ever eye closed. As God spoke to your heart, Would you like to be able to leave this morning knowing that you've been saved by Jesus? That He became your personal Savior? Would you like to know that? I invite you to come during this invitation and sit down here on the pew and I'll be glad to talk with you and pray with you this morning. You come.